Hello everyone, I once again welcome you all to my last lecture in this series of interpretive spectroscopy. Today let me summarize and conclude about whatever uh, we discussed about various uh, spectroscopic aspects, problems and conditions, definitions and all those things in the last 59 lectures. So this course is all about spectral interpretation and elucidation of the structure of known or unknown samples to understand about spectroscopic methods and their potential in chemistry and other science subjects. So general process for structure elucidation of an unknown sample, we have several avenues here. Of course, uh, before that we have to ensure that we have a pure compound even by physical measurements such as melting point, boiling point and all those things we should be able to tell whether the compound is pure or not and first of all our objective is to make the compounds in their purest form and then the purity can be assessed and also the identity can be found out from the spectral interpretation by taking various spectra and always to ascertain the purity and the nature of the molecule, we should always go for more than one type of spectroscopic or analytical means. So then when we have pure compound, we, we have several options as I mentioned, CHN analysis is there, elemental analysis, mass spectrometry, NMR and they give you some idea about molecular formula. Before that, once we know whatever we get from mass, mass fragment, molecular ion peak from that one using rule 13 and also hydrogen deficiency index, we should be able to identify tentative formula can be identified and then we can identify functional groups using these methods and also substructures again using NMR and eventually X-ray if it is a solid compound and we could be able to get the single crystals. And then molecular formula can also give you about saturation, unsaturation and also other groups, etc. And then we arrive at possible structures and then we have to write all possible isomers if there are any and then again go to the mercy of NMR, mass and IR to identify fragments and also different uh, positions of the chemical shifts and also stretching frequencies and we can write most possible structures and we can conform it and then you go known molecular formula if anything is there if the compound is already made or something we can compare the properties. So this is how the entire process takes place involving more than one spectroscopic means. We use different type of radiations of uh, electromagnetic waves in different instruments all these things are given here and of course corresponding energy in frequency is also given and also temperature of bodies emitting wavelengths is also given here. It is a very useful electromagnetic spectrum here. For example, radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. Of course, gamma rays also comes in mass, mass spectroscopy. So now what is important is approximate time scale for structure determination with various techniques. So this is very, very important because most of the molecules will be under dynamic process and also if the time scale does not suit, then we may not be seeing the information what we are looking for. Electron diffraction 10 raise to minus 20 up to whatever the dynamics that happens up to 10 raise to minus 20 can be analyzed X-ray 10 raise to minus 18, UV 10 raise to minus 15, visible 10 raise to minus 14 and IR and Raman 10 raise to minus 13 and ESR is coming down 10 raise to minus 4 to 10 raise to minus 8 and NMR 10 raise to minus 1 to 10 raise to minus 9 and fast kinetics 10 raise to minus 3 to 10 to 100 seconds and then physical separation they should be stable for more than 100 seconds. Then by looking at the morphology we should be able to pick and separate the isomers if they have different morphology. This is very, very important and say in, in a, especially in NMR time scale if the dynamics is beyond this scale what happens in order to see NMR for those we have to either speed up or uh, slow down the dynamic process. For example, that is the reason we go for uh, low temperature or high temperature NMR studies. And this periodic table shows uh, NMR active nuclei having non-zero nuclear spin and of course this color index is very useful in identifying. So it, given in orange all have I equals spin 1 and also red I equals spin half 
Many of them are there. You can see red, 1H, known ones are 13C, 31P, 19F, and all those things, even platinum, uh, tungsten, and all those things. And then 3 by 2, we have quite a few. 3 by 2 are there. Even boron, there is one 3 by 2, and also one 3 is also there. And then 5 by 2, like this. This is a very useful uh, periodic table uh, with color code for identifying nuclear spin having different values. And then nuclei with negative magnetic ratio will have highest energy for the most positive m values. This you should remember. Let us look into the effect of magnetic field on nucleus in a more classical way. So for this one, to understand what would happen, for example, nucleus, they behave like tiny bar magnets. When they are subjected to magnetic field, what happens? Some of them will be aligned with the field and some of them will be opposing the magnetic field. Nevertheless, because this induces a motion, because of this induced motion under magnetic field, what happened? They will start precisioning with respect to the applied magnetic field, but they would never align with the magnetic field and they will be at an angle. And then how do we move this angle in such a way that we flip it? Once when we flip it, what happens? We can see nuclear transition has occurred. So in order to do that one, what we do is we apply another magnetic field perpendicular to the applied magnetic field here. So that should have a frequency corresponding to the precision frequency of this nuclei under the influence of the major magnetic field here. And when the resonance occurs, it will be flipping. So this is all about NMR. So this how, if you see this is the axis here, this is the uh, direction of applied magnetic field. They are never aligned, but they will be precision with respect to that one here. You can see that one. And then how we can remove, move this one away from this one, increase the angle so that up to comes here and it will flip. That means you can say that nuclear transition has occurred. We know that delta S equals plus or minus 1 here. And then the frequency with which they persist about the applied magnetic field is called normal frequency here. So the orientation is not allowed by quantum mechanics. That means aligning is not allowed. They can never align with the magnetic field. That means they can always precise with an angle here. Then precision about B naught here. And then when it is precising, we are applying another magnetic field in a direction perpendicular to the applied magnetic field whose frequency should be the frequency of the precising nucleus. So in that case, what happens? The flipping happens and then it will, flipping means it's basically nuclear transition happens. That's what we say here. And then we can correlate this one. Since omega equals angular, it's a 2 pi nu. So then you can say nu equals gamma by 2 pi into B naught. This we should remember. This is a very, very important uh, equation here. Nu equals gamma over 2 pi into B naught. Gamma over 2 pi into B naught. Gamma is gyro magnetic ratio. This is how it is related. And gamma is constant here. 2 pi is constant. That means nu is directly proportional to the applied magnetic field. That means increase in the magnetic field increases the frequency. Decrease in the no, decreases the normal frequency. So this is how in the absence of the magnetic field, they have random orientation. The moment you apply magnetic field, what happens? They will try to align with the magnetic field or opposing the magnetic field. And then you can see very nicely in this cartoon how nicely it is flipping due to the applied frequency in the direction perpendicular to the applied magnetic field in the form of radio waves. So then this equation is very, very important. The energy difference is proportional to the magnetic field strength as mentioned. And this nu equals gamma h over 2 pi into B naught. Of course, h goes nu equals gamma over 2 pi into B naught is the very important one. With this one, most of the problems related to nuclear magnetic resonance can be understood. And this is a constant for each nucleus. And for hydrogen, it is 26.753 radian per tesla per second. That means here, in a 14,092 Gauss field, a 60 megahertz proton is required to flip a proton. The megahertz proton is required. That means what we are applying here, when the nucleus hydrogen is kept in this magnetic field, we are applying a magnetic field perpendicular to this with a frequency of 60 megahertz to see electronic transition. That's what it means. So this is its normal frequency and also the applied magnetic field strength is also 60 megahertz. This is low energy radio frequency we are using. One major difference between uh, EPR and this one is, so here magnetic field is uh, kept constant and we are using radio frequency we vary. Whereas in case of EPR, microwave radiation is kept constant and magnetic field strength is varied. That's the major difference. Otherwise, more or less, they are very similar when it comes to selection rule, everything.
and this table is very important. This gives about uh, different nuclei and their spin, natural abundance, and magnetogyric ratio, and also the corresponding NMR frequency. And then the two energy states. So, because of this one, when the transition is there, we call alpha state, and then it is beta state, we call it. And then the magnetic fields of the spinning nuclei will align either with the external field or against the field. And a photon with the right amount of energy can be observed and cause the spinning proton to flip. As I said, that is in the range of radio frequency. And then, as I said, this energy increases with the magnetic field. So, you can see here with increasing the magnetic field strength, the space between these two will also increase. And then, to look into the multiplicity of the chemical shifts, we use the n plus 1 rule here. For that one, we can use this Pascal triangle very readily, and we have Pascal triangles different for different spin system. This is for I equals half, and whereas this one is I for I equals 1, and also we have for I equals 3 by 2. So, uh, you can see here. So, these things we can be used appropriately when we are dealing with nuclei of different I values. So, this uh, shows about uh, how a typical AB turn it into a A2 system here with variation as the chemical shift difference and the coupling constant vary, typical AB system will become A2 system here. And then this is how one should be able to find out the chemical shift and coupling constant in a AB system. If you label them as delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, delta 4, this midpoint is the chemical shift and the spacing between delta 1, delta 2 or delta 3 and delta 4 is called the coupling constant here. Then I have shown a typical compound where non-equivalence is there because of heterosubstitution and adjacent carbon atoms. Here the second order comes into picture, they are called second order spin system. And then here how a ABC system, here you can see ABC system with increase in the field strength, they become almost like AB, AMX system or sometimes A to X2 system depending upon how much difference is there uh, in the chemical and magnetic equivalence here. And these things are already discussed in detail. You can go back to respective lectures. And then 31P NMR is very useful for studying uh, uh, reactions and reaction mechanism and especially when we are using phosphines in homogeneous catalysis for a different type of organic transformations because they have very distinct chemical shifts, 100 percent abundance is there, no quantity of sample is good enough. And also, there is no need to use you know, deuterated solvents that way in whatever the reaction we are doing, we can take it aliquot and we can check, we can do continuous reaction, we can do batch reactions and analyze the intermediate through variable temperature or time dependent NMR reaction. As I said here, you can see here, they have very distinct chemical shifts for P3, P5 and various phosphonides, phosphonides. Uh, chlorophosphines, etc. The extensive list is given here. And also, you can also analyze what would happen to the donor and acceptor properties simply by looking into the chemical shift positions here. And this is one interesting 15N NMR for this uh, cyclosporine. Here we have 11 different type of nitrogen atoms are there and this beautiful spectrum was obtained in just one hour uh, because the enriched one. You imagine this is not enriched one we have very minute percentage of 15N in nitrogen, rest is 14N and if you want to identify these things in a typical molecule that is not enriched, it would take 10 years to get this kind of spectrum. So, you can see how easy to obtain provided we have right kind of chemicals for labeling and enriching with the required isotopes here. This is one beautiful uh, spectrum of uh, 199 mercury coupled to fluorine atoms. You see, you can see this mercury is coupled. This is a very symmetric and uh, centrosymmetric molecule here. These two fluorines are coupling first to give a triplet and then these two will split each triplet into triplets of triplets and then we have CF3 groups are there, 6 are there. They split each line of triplet of triplets into septate and we get this beautiful spectrum here. This is a triplet of triplet of septates, triplet of triplets of septates, beautiful spectrum here. And then this one is another interesting molecule where we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 different type of uh, NMR active nuclei here. I just have shown 31P NMR here, how it looks like. It shows uh, 48 lines here. It is a triplet of doublets of doublets of quadrates. And this beautiful spectrum would look like this, very nice one. So, some of this. Uh, molecules would be very interesting to look into multinuclear NMR properties. 
So then let's move on to UV visible spectroscopy. So this is the very, very important Beer-Lambert's equation we are using here. So a longer path length through the sample will cause more UV light to be absorbed. The greater the concentration of the sample, the more UV light will be absorbed. And UV visible spectrum consists of absorbance A on Y axis and wavelength on the horizontal X axis. This is how a typical spectrum would look like. And then different type of electronic transitions are shown here. Uh, sigma to sigma star is the highest one and then pi to pi star and then n to pi star. How this energy level would change with by changing the functional groups and also having conjugation and all those things we have already discussed here. This we see routinely in alkanes, this we see in carbonyls and this we see in unsaturated compounds pi to pi star and this one uh, n to sigma star in O, N, S and halogen compounds and n to pi star in carbonyls. And then uh, here the total angular momentum quantum number again can be compared very nicely to what we saw in case of nucleus spin in a magnetic field, it's slightly different here. The total angular momentum J is the purple one, purple one, this is a combination of orbital in S blue and then the spin. So this is apart from going in a orbital surrounding the nucleus, they will be spinning with their axis with respect to that axis that is the spin and then L the combination J is L plus R minus S. So this you can see very nicely in this color. And then of course microstate and also the term symbols are very important. For microstate we use the equation N factorial over R factorial into N minus R factorial. N is the capacity of the subshell. So D 10 electrons, F 14 electrons that is 14 factorial, P it is 6 factorial and then this would represent the number of electrons. D 7 means it is 7 factorial into 10 minus 7 factorial and in numerator we have 10 factorial. So this is how we can find out the microstates. And then in case of electronic spectra, electrons may be promoted from one level to another one. That's what exactly happens, electronic transition. So during electronic transition, what happens? The low energy vibration rotation transitions will also occur, uh, but the energy difference between vibration rotation is too close to be resolved in an electronic spectrum. As a result, what happens? That results in broadening. And hence, the band widths will be in the order of 1000 to 3000 centimeter minus 1. So in a free gaseous metal ion, d are degenerate and no dd transients are observed. In a complex, degeneracy is lost because of splitting and also mixing with the S and P orbitals. As a result, dd transitions are allowed. Strictly speaking, dd transitions are forbidden, the proto-forbidden. The magnitude of delta O depends on the nature of the ligands and how that going to affect the energy of electron transition and the, hence the frequency of absorption maximum. So this depends not on the nature of the ligands and also nature of the metals and their position whether it is 3D, 4D or 5D and also the charge on them. The extent of splitting is related to the ligand positions in the spectrochemical series because of various donor and acceptor properties that you know that pure sigma donors pure sigma donors and pi donors and pure sigma donors and pi acceptors. And then as I mentioned earlier, all DD transitions can be simply classified into four categories, D0, D10, so no transition, colorless, if at all color comes, it has to be charge transfer transition, D0 it has to be a ligand to metal, D10 it has to be metal to ligand. And D5 it is unique, here it is Laporte forbidden, spin forbidden. As a result, what happens, those compounds are not colored. If at all color is there in case of tetrahedral complexes, it is pale in color. And then other eight categories, D1, D4, D6, D9, one electron, one less than half field, one more than half field, one less than completely filled, they show invariably one transition, whereas in case of D2, D3, D7, D8, two electrons, two less than half field, two more than half field, and two less than completely filled show invariably three transitions. In, in some cases in homoelliptic molecules, because of closer space of two transitions, you may see just two transitions. That's what we see in case of vanadium hexaqua vanadium 3 plus. So for example, here I showed you mercuric iodide. Mercury is in D10 system, brick red. Again, it's metal ligand charge transfer, KMnO4 or potassium dichromate. Their zero valent state D zeros, intense purple or orange color is there. That's again ligand to metal charge transfer. In case of bismuth triiodide, orange red, it is metal to ligand charge transfer transition. In case of Prussian blue, it is metal to metal charge transfer transition. So since iodide has a very high polarizability, which results in the ionic charge getting easily transferred to the Hg2 plus cation. 
So, this process releases some energy which falls in the visible spectrum as a result they appear brick red in color. Hence, we say that compounds like KMnO4, mercury iodide etcetera are highly colored. So, then selection rules are very important. Electronic transition may be classified as intense or weak according to the magnitude of the epsilon absorptive coefficient that corresponds to whether they are allowed or permanent transitions. Allowed transitions, these transitions have an E maximum of 10 raise to 4 or more and probability of their occurrence is very high. These are generally due to pi pi star transitions. And for example, 1, 3 butadiene shows absorption at 270 nanometer and then epsilon is about 20,900 represents an allowed transition. What are the forbidden transition? These are usually related to n to pi star transition. For these transitions, E maximum, epsilon maximum is generally less than 10 raise to 4. And then N to pi star transition of a saturated aldehyde or a ketones exhibit a weak absorption of low intensity, nearly about 285 nanometer and have the value of epsilon maximum less than 100 is a Fermidon transition. So, then selection rule it says delta L equals plus or minus 1 have high absorbance and spin selection rule delta S equals 0. That means, during electronic transition they should not change their spin, the upward spin should go to upward spin only, okay. whereas in case of nucleus upward spin will become downward spin. So, that is the difference. And then DD transitions are strictly speaking upward of forbidden because of mixing what happens they lose their identity and hence we see DD transition. Nevertheless, if you look into leopard delta L value, it is 5 to 10 liters per mole per centimeter, very, very low that itself indicates these transitions are strictly speaking leopard of forbidden. So, when transition metal forms a complex M is surrounded by ligands, mixing of D and P orbits may occur and as a result transitions are no longer true DD in nature. Because of a slight relaxation in Leopard rule, DD transitions are observed and also in case of octahedral complexes or highly centrosymmetric complexes, what happens when the ligands are vibrating and often they come out of their mean position. As a result what happens? They come out, when, when they come out of mean position, the center of symmetry will be lacked in those things. As a result, what happens? Mixing would occur and they show transitions. For example, tetrabromomagnet is a tetrahedral, is colored, and then this one, heterosubstituted pentamine chlorocobalt, is octahedral with unsymmetrical substitution, they are colored. Whereas this one, if you look into homoelliptic, this one, hexa aqua copper or hexa aqua cobalt have central symmetry and no mixing of P and D orbits are there and they are not colored. However, the metal to ligand bond vibrates so that the ligand spends an appreciable amount of time out of their central symmetric equilibrium position. As a result, small amount of mixing do occur and low intensity transitions are observed. So, that means this is how you can explain still if they show pale color instead of not showing any color at all. And then in case of IR, this is very, very important how this uh, stretching frequency is related to the stretching force constant and the reduced mass of those two atoms involved in a bond. So, that means the vibration motions and frequencies of a structure containing several balls of different masses connected by springs, they are not like rigid one, they are almost like connected like a spring and just if you, if you just tap another one, they will be moving around. So, it shows the vibration something like this. And then here the stretching frequency is related to force constant and reduced mass in this one. This is an ideal equation, simplified equation one can use comfortably to find out if the stretching frequency is given, force constant can be found out very easily because others are constant. The, in a diatomic molecule, we have to find out mu is reduced mass, it is m1, m2 by m1 plus m2. For example, if you see here, what would happen when they are substituted ones, okay, here, observed here is 2150, here IR inactive and they also they show different type of vibrations, wagging and twisting. The twisting mode produces no change in dipole moment and hence IR inactive in symmetrical modes here and they show different type of uh, vibrational motions. This is symmetric stretching and anti-symmetric scissoring, rocking and wagging. So, these are all symmetric ones, these are all anti-symmetric ones. As I mentioned, this is the equation one can use comfortably. This is the simple derivative from Hooke's law, how they are related. This is another simple equation, stretching frequency is related to 130.3 into square root of F over mu, F is force constant, mu is reduced mass. 
and then here for example, all the three equations are there, you can always examine because everything is given here, reduced mass is given, force constant is given, frequency is given, simply apply and then verify and this is for homework or assignment you can keep doing and of course some of them I have shown here, you can just look into it, A couple of examples also I included here for C double bond C also here. And now when it comes to IR, carbonyl compounds very, very important and carbonyl compounds you know that it forms a sigma bond through the lone pairs from carbon giving to appropriate metal orbitals either D z square or dx minus y square and this is the antibonding. Pi star would interact with uh, pi symmetry orbitals from the metal dxy, dyz or dxz to generate antibonding and bonding and the bonding will be populated with electrons from the metal that we call it as back bonding and the same thing we call it as in terms of spectroscopy, charge transfer. These two modes of bonding are mutually reinforcing this metal to carbon bond that is called synergistic effect and charge removal through pi bonding leads to more extensive sigma bonding and will charge donated through sigma bonding that facilitates further back bonding. So that means sigma donation will make electron deficient and back donation makes electrons rich and they will be acting in tandem, this is called synergistic effect. And then it is very interesting to compare the stretching frequencies in these homoelliptic molecules of having different electronic configuration D10, D6, etc. And then if you notice here, in case of nickel tetracarbonyl, stretching frequency is quite high. That means not much backbonding occurs here. Of course, this entire molecule survives on backbonding only as a MO diagram clearly shows that there is no sigma bond, there is no carbonyl electrons donating to nickel to generate nickel to carbon sigma bond. Here it lacks unlike CrCO6 where we have a well designated chromium to carbon sigma bond whereas here it is not there. So that is the reason these compounds are very volatile and and very reactive and very sensitive compounds, they can readily decompose. In fact, NiCO4 was made with an intention of getting pure nickel for catalytic purpose through decomposition. And this is how this SIBO bond can vary here, it can become if more electron density goes to the pi star, it becomes almost like a ketonic carbonyl group. And then of course here I have shown for different substituted carbonyl groups 4, 5 and 3 and having different geometric isomers, cis and trans, how many active IR bands are observed for 3 stretching frequency for CO. For example, here when you have 3, you can have facial or meridional. In case of meridional, you will see 3, whereas in case of facial, you will see 2. And of course, these are all for homoelliptic molecules, all L should be same, L3. But if it is different, then they also expected to show 3 bands here. And in case of this one, we have C2V symmetry and we will see 4 bands, here we have D4H, we will see only 1 band and here in case of square pyramidal relationship in octahedral, MO C4 symmetry C4V, so we will see 3, so this is how you should be able to identify based on the point groups here. So further elaborated for uh, trigonal bipyramidal also and also for tetrahedral compounds here, how uh, it varies when we substitute one or more carbonyl with other ligands. And this is about mass, mass also this periodic table gives about natural abundance of different isotopes that comes very handy in characterizing the compounds through mass spectrometry. So here what we should remember is this is EPR, uh, one should uh, remember this equation very well, from that one we should be able to calculate G, G is very similarly you can compare it to coupling constant we see in case of NMR. And then for a free electron this is 2.0023 and then of course here we consider only J equals L plus S whereas in case of uh, uh, electron spectroscopy we consider both L plus S and L minus S and we should remember for G H mu or beta H, beta H, H is the field, magnetic field strength. Here also with increase in magnetic field the energy associated with the electronic spin also increases and it will go to higher frequency. This is a typical uh, EPR spectrum is shown here, here uh, we have an electron here, odd electron, so then we have to use 2 Ni plus 1 rule and they all of them have I equals 1, so it splits into 9 of this intensity, you can see this beautiful spectrum here. And of course here I have not shown these things and hydrogen, hyperfine splitting is not shown, this splitting whatever I have shown is due to 4 of them here with I equals 1. 
So, then this say about hyperspin splitting, you can see here first this electron will be split from these two into a quintet because 2 n i plus 1 if you use i equals 1, 5 will be there and then we have 4 hydrogen atoms are there, 4 hydrogen atoms with i equals half will split each one into quintet, we will see quintet of quintets, we can see quintet of quintets here. So, this is a very, very beautiful uh, hyperfine splitting spectrum, EPR spectrum of this anion here. And then for a radical, the magnetic field is 38.1 g, the frequency of the microwave is 9600 megahertz, what is the value of its g factor? g factor can be simply calculated and here apart from B naught for g equals h over B naught is a constant that is calculated here, it comes around 71.4484 and then this value is given here and then divided by magnetic field there you get directly 1.8 here. So, this is how you can calculate the unknown quantity using this simple equation here in case of EPR. This is again mass spectrometry, this gives various fragments and the corresponding mass one can see very nicely here. And then of course, if we have hydrogen index deficiency we can find out first we can use 13 rule and then 13 rule will give you approximate uh, a molecular formula from molecular formula again apply uh, index of hydrogen deficiency and find out the tentative structural formula and then take the help of data obtained from various spectrometer to elucidate the structure. And then isotopic patterns for compounds containing different elements also shown here, this is very, very important and also the ratio also one should remember how it shows in case of uh, hydrogen and phosphorus and fluorine you see only one whereas in carbon. 13 C is there 1.1 and nitrogen 15 N very small O17 and then here 32 we will see and 34 so small quantity again 35 and 37 we will see here. In case of metals we see a patterns very unique for each metal so you can see something like this. If you have these things handy when you have the spectrum you should be able to identify even if the metal is unknown and rule of 13 is very important as we said and then take the mass divided by 13 and uh, quotient whatever is there, quotient will be the number of carbon atoms, quotient plus remainder will be the hydrogen and then you can have something like this. And then for hetero atoms what happens if nitrogen is there you take out CH2 12 plus 2 and oxygen is there take CH4 and then sulfur is there take C2H8 and phosphorus is there C2H7. So, that is 31, 24 plus 7, 31 and then if chlorine is there C 2 H 11 you take or if hydrogen deficiency is there you can also take C 3 H minus that means every C L you take, take out 3 carbon atoms add 1 hydrogen atom and for bromine you can take out C 6 H 7 and 127 iodine you take out C 10 H 7. So, this is how you can adjust the formula to arrive at tentative formula for example, it is shown here and possible candidates with hetero atoms and nitrogen rule is also you should remember a molecule with even number of molecular weight must contain either no nitrogen or even number of nitrogen. A molecule with odd number molecular weight must contain an odd number of nitrogen. So, you should remember these things when you are using rule 13. So, let me conclude now. So far I had discussed several spectroscopy methods and several problems and of course, at some point of time we have to conclude the lecture series. And I hope this was very useful and many of you are interested in taking exams, competitive exams to get into higher studies or doctoral work or some of you may be doing doctoral work and all those things. One thing I am telling you, this learning never ends, learning never ends and also for students learning is the profession. When the learning is profession, your attitude has to be right. How to set your attitude? Uh, to become a humble student is you have to have first these another five entities such as in this profession of learning you should have sincerity, honesty, dedication, discipline and determination. When you inculcate these five entities in your profession of learning you will be having a right attitude to achieve whatever you want and to make a mark in whatever the subject you just embrace for your higher studies and other things. With this, I wish you all the very best. Okay, you should remember, be greedy for learning and be content with earning as far as you are a student. You should not think about earning. And also you can see here, only one letter 
makes a difference between learning and earning. And, and case of, of course, when you earn, when you are learning, this after enough learning, this L will disappear and will assimilate in this one so that you will be earning. So from this point of view, I will tell you again, be greedy for learning and be content with earning. I wish you all the very best. God bless you. Thank you so much.